Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 13010, Evidence and Proof. We're into week four. We're dealing with oral evidence and um, this week um, I just want to deal with a few specific issues um, that in a sense skirt around the issue of oral evidence. I'll leave it for you to read the study guides and read the textbook in terms of what oral evidence is all about. But some of the concepts that I think are important. First, competence and compelability. So if we're going to talk about oral evidence, we have to talk about who can go into the witness box and give the evidence. So I'm sure you know what competence means, someone who is competent by law to testify, to give evidence. Compelability, someone who is compellable to give evidence in, in that they must attend, they are obliged to give evidence, um, the threat being contempt of court if they fail to give the evidence. But obviously people are privileged and uh, the most common form of privilege is the privilege against um, um, self-incrimination. So a person who might be compellable, might be competent, uh, can decline to answer certain questions in certain circumstances such as to do that uh, would incriminate me you know, by giving the answer. So where do we look for these rules if challenged in a court? to justify your position about competence or compelability or privilege, or more importantly, if you're asked these sorts of questions in an examination, where do we look for the answers to support our statements of law? Always good training. We look at the legislation first. If not, we consider case law. Don't forget, practice directions um, can sometimes be relevant um, or rules or regulations. So of course, if we're dealing with Queensland law and we're dealing with competence and compelability, privilege, the first thing we think about is the Evidence Act. Does anyone rem remember the year that the Evidence Act in Queensland um, was passed? The Evidence Act, Evidence Queensland? Act Queensland? Is it, was 77. it 77? That's it, 77. Quick quiz, Commonwealth. You notice I'm looking at the air. <laughs> 95. Very good. Excellent. All right. So Evidence Act, Commonwealth and Queensland. Um, section 9, we need to look at when we're dealing with issues to do with competence and um, there is a presumption that every person is competent. What about children? Is there a presumption that they're competent to give evidence? What's the starting point, the, the default position? Could be a trick question. Answer is yes, every person, that includes children, presumed to be competent to give evidence in proceedings and presumed to be competent to give evidence on oath. But there are some exceptions. In fact, under legislation in Queensland, there's only one exception. You'll find that conveniently in section 9A. And the exception is this that a witness uh, may not be capable of giving an intelligible account of events. And if that is the case, then they are not competent to give evidence. Go beyond section nine and nine A. And you know, when we talk about A, we mean capital A. So it's like an insert. So go beyond nine, go beyond nine A, have a look at nine B, nine C and nine D in particular, in relation to the issue of competence to give evidence. Now, the court can decide for itself whether a person is competent to give evidence. That's, that's 9A of the uh, Act. So it, it ultimately, it comes down to this. The court must form an opinion that a person can give an intelligible account of evidence, um, of events rather, in which case they are competent to give evidence. Does that make sense? And then there's the further question, all right, well, they, they may be competent to give evidence, but are they then, in addition to that, competent to give sworn evidence? And that begs a question, doesn't it? You might think, well, I thought all evidence given in a court was sworn evidence. I thought all evidence either had to be on oath or, you know, um, by way of affirmation. You know, like if someone gives evidence in a court, you, you, you know that the bailiff or the court will say, do you wish, or the um, uh, 
the, the support officer in, in a tribunal will say, do you wish to give evidence on oath or um, sworn evidence um, on the Bible, or do you wish to give um, affirmation evidence? So have a look at the Oaths Act, section 17, which says that someone can um, give their evidence by solemn affirmation instead of being sworn to give oath, um, you know, evidence on the Bible or the Quran, whatever the, the, you know, whatever they prefer. So anyway, I'm, I digress. So the first thing is that when we look at section nine, the presumption is everybody is competent to give evidence. Then the court can make its decision in, based on its opinion, whether someone can give an intelligible account of events or not. In order to give evidence, they can also then go further and say, well, is this person competent to give sworn evidence? A person is competent to give sworn evidence on oath if the court thinks that they understand that giving the evidence is serious, it's a serious matter, and that they have an obligation to tell the truth. Okay? Uh, I mean, everyone has an ordinary duty to tell the truth, but this is like really important uh, obligation. So um, what that says is that someone might be competent to give evidence, but not competent to give evidence on oath. The court needs to explain to the person the duty of, um, of speaking the truth as an obligation. Now have a look at um, section 9C. 9C is interesting because this creates an exception, the only one I can think of, to the common law rule that evidence in chief is not admissible if only it relates to credit. Now, what does all that mean? So if you're trying to run a case and you call a witness to give evidence in chief, and the only thing they're going, they've got to say is, well, that person's actually dishonest because I've seen them ripping people off, you know, down, you know, or, or uh, they lied on a test um, or, you know, something else, or they, um, you know, they, they, they put sticky tape on a, a cricket ball. I shouldn't say that. Um, but, you know, this is evidence about the person's, um, uh, pu purely their, their evidence about, um, you know, their, their truthfulness gener in general terms, or their credit is the word I'm looking for. I'm tired. It's a big, it's a big day. Um, so there is an exception. 9C creates the exception. Someone can give um, expert evidence about, say, a child's level of perception or memory or expression to allow the court to make the determination as to whether or not that person is competent to give evidence. So 9C provides the mechanism by which the court can make its decision under 9A or 9B, if that makes sense. And have a look at um, section 9D, which um, provides that um, that which is written in a deposition is um, something that can be considered as giving, uh, given as evidence on oath. Um, <clears throat> so just be watch, careful of that. Uh, there are a couple of things, a couple of cases that deal with the issue of an intelligible account of events. For example, in um, R against Drover, which is uh, Queensland District Court, 1990, it's an unreported decision. Judge Morley refused to allow the evidence of a young girl. Judge Morley said that um, the evidence is excluded because the young girl had all the qualities of a young actress, reciting what she knew by recitation, not by recollection. So that's the sort of thing that the court can consider. But the court must explain to the person um, the importance of speaking the truth. And there are a few cases where trials have been quashed because a trial judge didn't give the warning to, say, a young child that even though they're not under oath, they have a duty to tell the truth. And it's remarkable. You might have a four-day trial and defence will look through every aspect and think, now, did, did the judge comply with this law? Did the judge comply with that law? And if the judge didn't do take a step that ought to have been taken, such as advising a witness who's not under oath that they must still tell the truth, you'd think that would be implicit. But if the judge doesn't say it, 
that's enough potentially to quash the entire trial. Okay, um, so it is possible to admit unsworn evidence uh, generally. Um, can I just say this, that when we're looking at all these sorts of things, it begs the question as to whether or not the evidence which is presented is um, reliable and can be treated as safe and, and uh, satisfactory. What that means is that if we have a and if we have an acquittal, then it's almost beyond um, question that it is acceptable um, for a jury to come to that conclusion. But if the result is a um, um, uh, if the result is a conviction, sorry, uh, some noise in the background here. If the result is a conviction, um, then it's always open for the defence to argue that the jury should not have convicted, and it was based, and its decision to do so was unsafe and unsatisfactory. I mean, you remember obviously you remember Baden Clay, and the Court of Appeal decided that the jury should not have found. Baden Clay guilty of murder, and the Court of Appeal said the decision um, was unsafe and it was unsatisfactory. There was some evidence that was consistent with innocence. That caused the Court of Appeal to have a reasonable doubt. And the Court of Appeal said, well, effectively said, I had to say it, but effectively said, because we've got a reasonable doubt, the jury should have had a reasonable doubt. Therefore, the conviction is unsafe and unsatisfactory. I've I was quite opposed to that decision with all due respect to the Court of Appeal. It's easy for me to say that now because the High Court uh, shared that view and set aside the orders of the Court of Appeal and um, uh, dismissed, effectively dismissed the order that was made by the Court of Appeal, thereby reinstating the um, murder conviction. All right, are there any questions so far or are we all good? All fine? Let's, let's press on then. Um, so, in relation to the Commonwealth, <clears throat> so we've talked about the Queensland position. In terms of competence and compelability in the Commonwealth, where do we look? The Evidence Act Commonwealth. Have a look at, yes, Samantha was there ready to, to show the, the EA, Commonwealth. Um, have a look at sections 12 and 13, which deal with the issue of competence, compelability, um, the issue of lack of capacity is important and um, a person is not competent to give evidence at the Commonwealth level if that person does not have the capacity to understand a question about a fact or does not have a capacity to give an answer that can be understood and that incapacity cannot be overcome. So simply because someone, for example, is mute does not mean that they lack competence, capacity to give evidence it's up to the court to try to overcome that issue of the person not being able to be understood in a traditional way. For example, have a look at sections 30 and 31 of the Commonwealth Evidence Act, which enable the court to um, overcome certain disabilities for witnesses in giving evidence. And remember that because a person may be not competent to give evidence about a fact, that does not exclude them from giving evidence about any other fact necessarily. All right, so I'll try and keep to keep moving through this. Um, let's talk about the tactical burden to testify and call witnesses or lead evidence. So this is within the context of oral evidence, and we're talking now about tactical burdens. Evidence Act Queensland, have a look at sections six and seven. And basically it says that in section six, no person should be excluded from giving evidence in proceedings because they may have an interest in the question or the result of the proceeding. I mean, for example, um, I mean, well, one that I sort of was involved in in the tribunal, um, Manufactured Homes Act and uh, rent reviews, um, you might call to give evidence the park owner of an adjoining park to say what's a reasonable rent. Um, that sort of evidence can't be excluded simply because that person giving evidence may have uh, some sort of result, may have a vested interest in the result. Anyway, section six of the act is what you need to look at. Section seven, 
deals more particularly with um, parties, their wives and husbands as witnesses. And if it's not a criminal proceedings, then um, the spouse is competent and compellable to give evidence on behalf of either party. Now, that relates to civil matters. Um, if it's criminal, it's a different thing. Um, in which case, um, we then raise the issue of Jones and Dunkel. Have you come across Jones and Dunkel, the rule in Jones and Dunkel? It's actually important from a practical point of view. It deals with the issue of the tactical burden to give evidence. So <clears throat> I'll just explain what Jones and Dunkel was all about. And bear in mind that Jones and Dunkel is a case that applies in the civil sphere. Um, effectively, it, it comes down to this. In Jones and Dunkel, the failure for a party to step into the witness box and give evidence on oath may give rise to an adverse inference. So what happened is this. In Jones and Dunkel, uh, Jones was the widow of a truck driver. The plaintiff's husband was killed in head-on collision with another truck. Dunkel was the driver of that truck. And in the civil claim, Dunkel refused to give evidence or declined to give evidence is a better way of putting it. Now, there was, there were no, there was no other evidence around as to what caused this collision. And the question then arose, and I guess you're thinking this, well, if the widow is suing someone to say, you have caused my husband to be killed as a result of the way in which you drove the truck, there's no other witnesses, there's nobody else. I mean, does that beg the question as to whether Dunkel should get into the witness box from a tactical burden perspective and give evidence to say, well, this is actually what happened? And if Dunkel refuses to get in the box, it declines to go into the box, are you then entitled to draw an inference to say, well, on the balance of probabilities, he's not going into the witness box, probably because he was at fault. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, the High Court considered this. So this is Jones and Dunkel. Windayer uh, said, rightly or wrongly, I have in mind that the defendant could have come here today given evidence, am I entitled to regard this failure as a weakness in his case? And no, the court said yes. Menzies gave the, ba the, the, the basis for the decision this way. The absence of the defendant to, to come along as a witness can't be used to make up for any deficiency in the plaintiff's evidence. But the arbiter of fact can more easily accept the evidence that has been provided by the plaintiff if um, the defendant had given evidence to contradict it. So where there's an inference open to an arbiter of fact, the question is whether it an inference should be drawn against the defendant. The fact that the defendant not to give evidence is properly to be considered in drawing that, um, that, that inference. So that's Jones and Dunkel. Now Jones and Dunkel went further um, in other cases and covers situations where a party fails to call a material witness. That's actually where we often talk about it. You know, if, if your defence is, um, look, I don't owe the debt because my parents paid the debt, and you don't call your parents to go into the witness box and say, I paid the debt, here's how I did it, are you entitled to draw a conclusion that, well, maybe the parents didn't actually pay the debt? Um, you would think that they would call that person to give evidence in those circumstances. So that's civil um, cases. In criminal cases, a person is competent to give evidence, but not compellable to do so if they're the defendant. So can the rule in Jones and Dunkel really be used to penalise a defendant in a criminal matter who fails to testify? In Queensland, there's no absolute ban on a trial judge or even Crown Counsel making some adverse comment to the jury regarding the failure of the accused to go into the witness box and testify. It's a little different at the Commonwealth sphere, section 20 of the, um, 20 subsection 2 of the Commonwealth Evidence Act says that Crown Counsel, prosecution, may not comment on the failure of an accused to go into the witness box to testify on their own behalf. The trial judge can, but they have to be careful. 
Okay, so a couple of important cases here. We're going to mention Weissensteiner and we'll mention as a party. Firstly, Weissensteiner. This is a case of the High Court, 1993, 178 CLR 217. So this is, if you like, the leading common law case in Queensland that deals with the issue of whether a trial judge might instruct a jury to draw an adverse inference against a person who failed to testify. Here are the circumstances of Weissensteiner. See what you think. So two people go out in a boat. It's just two of them out in the ocean. One of them disappears without trace. And the person who's charged, Weissensteiner, is found in sole possession of the vessel and was on board it when the person went missing and was last seen alive. Weissensteiner gives no evidence. So the High Court said, okay, it's a criminal case, but how about we look at it from this perspective? Any hypoth hypothesis which is consistent with innocence may cease to be rational or reasonable in the absence of evidence to support when the material evidence must be within the knowledge of the accused. So in that instance, silence can, uh, cannot amount to an admission, but the jury cannot and should not be required to shut their eye to the consequence to the defendant of exercising that right. So the court, the High Court said, you can still have your right to silence, but the jury is entitled to say, you know, heck, you would think that there's only two people in the boat, it's a big ocean, he must have, Weissensteiner must have known what happened, and the fact that he failed to get in the witness box and explain it means that the defence submission that, um, you know, some other hypothesis consistent with innocent, it may not be rational or reasonable in those circumstances. So after Weissensteiner, Crown Counsel would regularly give what they call a Weissensteiner direction or ask the court to give a Weissensteiner direction to the jury. Um, but there were limitations on that. Um, I won't go into those limitations, but um, effectively, well, there's one, R against Ryan, 2002 QCA 92, that's Ryan. The trial judge was not entitled to give a Weissensteiner direction when they, um, when they were aware that the accused had previously given a version of events, even though they didn't give the version at trial. Okay, so let's talk about the other case as a party. As a party against the Queen, this is 2001 CLR 50, and it went something like this. Um, criminal trial, therefore accused, is not bound to give evidence. The prosecution must prove its case beyond reasonable doubt. So in criminal cases, do not, um, in criminal cases, the court said, we don't apply the observations of Jones and Dunkel without considering those things. Okay, so they're the kind of the overarching principles of criminal law matters. And the High Court said, you've got to keep those firmly in mind, deal with them as a foremost consideration before even thinking about Jones and Dunkel. I hope that makes some sense. So the as a party um, comment is what a judge should normally give. And it goes something like this. If an accused does not give evidence, the court um, should warn the jury that the accused silence is not evidence against the accused. It doesn't amount to an admission and it can't be used to fill gaps in the evidence of the prosecution. So you can see that an as a party comment is quite different to a Weissensteiner direction. Weissensteiner is still valid in some circumstances. Uh, for example, if the complainant gives a preliminary statement to police but doesn't support that statement at trial, becomes hostile, that might be uh, grounds for um, a Weissensteiner direction. But generally speaking, um, it will be an as a party comment. Now, this is on trials. If it's a sentence hearing, then um, the judge can effectively think about if there's a challenge, if there's an asser assertion made that relates to the factual issues and defence don't um, <clears throat> challenge, challenge that in a sentence hearing, then um, the court might 
give themselves a Weissenstein direction or what amounts to a Weissenstein direction. Look, there is one other case to consider. Um, Dr. John Forbes in his book says that this case, which is Dyer, D-Y-E-R, against the Queen, 2002, 210, CLR, 285, actually um, overrules Weissensteiner. I'm not sure it goes that far, but um, it is another case to consider. Uh, certainly the, the High Court said in Dyer that in that particular case, a Weissensteiner direction was not appropriate. What happened is um, the Dyer was involved in the allegations of sexual assault by the accused on a 13-year-old girl 11 years previously, and the accused tendered extracts from his diary that indicated he'd been with other people, but didn't call those other people as witnesses uh, in his defence. And the court said, look, it's not appropriate to uh, expect Dyer to call evidence um, in those circumstances, and the jury shouldn't speculate about what the evidence might have been uh, for, in relation to those people that were not called. So I know it gets a little bit confusing, but think of it this way. Think about the distinction between civil and criminal. When we're talking civil, think Jones and Dunkel. When we're talking criminal, think Weiss and Steiner, as a party and dire. Does that make sense? Now, one little variation on this is a case of Apostolides, and basically it's, it's a High Court case, 1984, 154, CLR 563. The High Court held that a trial judge can't basically force the Crown to call a witness, and you'll see that very often. Um, the Crown prosecutor will make a decision whether to call a certain witness or not. The Crown doesn't have to call every witness that might have something to say about a case. I mean, a judge can actually call a witness, but that would be very extraordinary. I, I certainly haven't seen that happen. But um, uh, Apostolides is the authority that a Crown might use if they say, well, I'm not going to call that person. I don't, I just, well, you know, they're not, uh, their evidence is not appropriate. Okay, um, just some variations. Think about the issue of competence and compelability of witnesses in criminal cases other than the accused. Have a look at Section 8 of the Queensland Evidence Act. It kind of works like this. Section 8 says, we've got more than one accused. Each can give favourable evidence to one or more of the co-accused. But they can't be compelled to testify for any of the co-accused. Um, and it's not, as far as the Crown is concerned, a co-accused in a cutthroat defence is not competent to be called to give evidence against the other. So what tends to happen in these situations is this. If you get one um, defendant who is willing to say, I'm guilty, they will normally be sentenced. And only after sentence will they come in and give evidence against their co-accused. So have a look at Section 8 and uh, just work your way through that provision. In the Commonwealth sphere, have a look at Section 17 of the Commonwealth Act and um, think about uh, Section 8 um, and Section 17 as the two main, main sections dealing with issues to do with uh, spouse or co-accused as the case may be. How are you going? You're keeping up with this? I know it's a lot of talking. If you've got any questions, comments, please feel free to, to jump in. And you may need to, to watch this a few times, but uh, uh, you're doing well. All right, I'll just keep going for a bit longer. Um, privilege, I mentioned privilege at the start. So a person who is compellable may be relieved of the obligation to answer a question if they are privileged. Main privilege, and privilege is really designed to ensure that there's fairness and, it, you know, and, and there's justice. Um, so people aren't obliged to give evidence 
uh, which would amount to self-incrimination. And in some circumstances, legal professional privilege means a lawyer is entitled to say, I'm not going to give evidence about that because that information that came to me from a client is privileged. Does that make sense? So self-incrimination, um, it's essentially part of this right to silence. And that's why people that are accused can never be compelled to testify at their own trial. They can choose to be, to give evidence, but, but the Crown can never compel an accused to give evidence. Have a look at section 15 of the Queensland Act in that regard. Um, where it gets a bit interesting is where people are compelled to give evidence at the Australian Crime Commission or the uh, Crime and Corruption Commission. And um, in those circumstances, the right to silence does not apply. The right to um, claim privilege for self-incrimination does not apply. But if you're ever in a position where you're advising a client who has been subpoenaed to um, appear in those circumstances, uh, it's always wise to seek certain written assurances or, or some formal assurance from the Crown, from the, um, uh, from the investigative authority, uh, say the Triple C, for example, as to what use they may be made of that information, given that it was um, provided um, uh, against the person's uh, um, will. Okay, so privilege under criminal, uh, sorry, in Queensland law, uh, Evidence Act, have a look at section 10, which provides the statutory basis for the privilege against self-incrimination. Now, the reason that we keep coming back to the Evidence Act, both Commonwealth and Queensland, as I mentioned at the start, is this. If you're asked to justify your legal conclusion or legal statement, always consider the statutory provision first. So Section 10, Privilege um, Against Self-Incrimination, and in Section 15, deals with questioning a person charged in criminal proceedings. So they're not entitled to refuse an answer in certain circumstances. Um, that is, if they give evidence, for example. If, if the person voluntarily goes in and gives evidence, um, then they can't then claim privilege. Once they've decided to go in the witness box, they can be asked questions and they'll be compelled to answer those questions um, in relation to the offence for which they're charged, why they're there. So the privilege is not absolute in all circumstances, is really what I'm trying to say. So have a look at set 10 and 15 and work your way through those sections and um, think about the reasons behind this. Um, and uh, one of the leading cases, you really need to, to look at this and have it catalogued you might be able to use this in plenty of circumstances, is Bunning against Cross. Bunning and Cross. It's 1978, 141 CLR at 54. So this is all about fairness. So Bunning and Cross says, if a witness is forced to give evidence after having claimed the privilege and being denied it, then the answers would not be admissible in later proceedings because they're not voluntary. So if you're forced to give an answer, then it's an involuntary statement. And Bunning and Cross says anything that's um, unfairly obtained uh, is not proper evidence. Um, legal professional privilege. Just one in interesting case. Um, R against Williams, 1999, QSC 185. A, uh, a female legal aid uh, solicitor employee met a man through a dating agency. Um, he mentioned certain marital problems he was having, uh, made a comment, you know, something to the effect uh, that he would be better off with his wife dead. Um, he was charged with her murder and the court held that the statement made to the legal aid lawyer was not privileged because it wasn't part of the legal um, relationship that they had, but a personal relationship that they had. The fact that she happened to be a lawyer was incidental and did not override the general rule of uh, compelability to give evidence. All right, so um, when it comes to civil law, 
Another privilege relates to documents prepared for litigation. And um, the leading case there is SO Australia against Federal Commissioner of Taxation, which is 1999 201 CLR 49. That's SO against FCT, 1999 201 CLR. The High Court overruled Grant and Downs, which was the previous case. And uh, basically, the test for whether legal advice or documents prepared for litigation was the is the dominant purpose test. What's the dominant purpose as to why those things were created? And if it was the dominant purpose was for litigation, then um, that's privileged. You can lose the privilege, uh, sometimes even through inadvertent um, disclosure. So this is this is an interesting case. So in R against Tompkins, the citation is 67, Criminal Appeal Reports 181, Tompkins attempted to pass a note, and on that note he admitted perjury, to his counsel during a trial. But the note fell to the floor, and Crown Counsel picked it up and used it for cross-examination. I mean, I just, this would have been absolutely bizarre circumstances. And the court held, no, it, you dropped it on the floor, Crown picked it up, you've lost your privilege. I actually find that really quite bizarre, the whole thing, but it's an interesting case. Um, one thing that you will see often uh, in civil law matters is this without prejudice privilege. Have you come across that? Without prejudice? People will often claim privilege on the basis that uh, we're trying to genuinely attempt to resolve the matter and uh, as a result anything that we send to you marked without privilege in that attempt to resolve the matter cannot be raised in court proceedings. It's a little bit like the issue of confidentiality and mediation but again there are some limits to that but bear in mind that that's another way of trying to um, claim privilege, legal professional privilege. Sometimes we use that without prejudice communication in the context of legal costs. So an important thing to remember is this, it's called Calder Bank. Calder Bank against Calder Bank, 1995, three All England reports, 333. The actual case isn't that important in terms of the fact, but the concept is important. And you'll often hear this, and law lawyers will often talk about making a Calder Bank offer. So you've got to know what it is. Um, and it, the, the way in which you can tell that this is a call to bank offer is that usually there's at the top of the letter, um, which is making the offer, it says, without prejudice, save us to costs. Without prejudice, save us to costs. That's, that's the earmark of a call to bank offer. And what it really means is, look, you can't, this letter can't be used in proceedings um, about whether someone is, you know, you know, going to win or lose. But if there's an argument about legal costs, we reserve the right to raise it at that, at that stage. It, does that make sense? So you might say, look, here's my offer to settle. Uh, your claim is for $100,000. I'm willing to give you $60,000. And um, in a call to bank offer, which is without prejudice save as costs, if eventually the court says, look, we're going to allow the claim, but only $50,000. When it comes to the um, court saying, all right, well, the defendant better pay all the legal costs. That's when the call to bank letter comes out and he says, but your honor, th three years ago, right at the start of the litigation, we offered $60,000. Clearly the plaintiff should have taken it. So the penalty for the plaintiff not taking it, given that they didn't make the, they didn't make the mark that we had offered them, is they've got to pay their own costs and perhaps even they've got to pay our costs because they should have taken it three years ago. Does that make sense? That's what, that's what we mean by a call to bank offer, which is um, uh, without prejudice, save as to costs. Um, and so this whole thing relates to privilege where there is settlement negotiations. Have a look at section 131 of the Commonwealth Evidence Act, which deals with the issue of excluding evidence of settlement negotiations, um, which is really giving statutory 
force to this whole without prejudice type arrangement. Gee, you're being patient. I'm doing a lot of talking, but there's a lot to cover. And I'm trying to identify the main pieces of legislation, the main cases that you want to be aware of, and um, try and uh, highlight these in your reading and as you go. All right. So are there any um, questions? Does anyone have any issues that they want to discuss? All right. Good. Well, again, you've been very patient. Um, I might call it quits to the session at this stage. And um, next week is week five. After that, we have the vacation week. All right. So um, thank you very much for attending and um, all the best. We'll see you soon. Bye then.